I'd like to move on to our first panel of the morning, entitled The Green Era Challenges and Choices for New Entrepreneurs Today. I invite our panelists to come down and join me. Our moderator is Susanna Cass, who is a Grazia Dio MBA graduate and recipient of the school's Distinguished Alumnus Award for 2009. Suzanne is an entrepreneur and an active spokesperson in the fields of energy and clean technology. She's an operating executive who has launched key initiatives with Hewlett Packard, with Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, and with eBay International, among many, many others. She acts as a mentor to many entrepreneurs and she serves on the boards of several startup companies. And Susanna will introduce the members of her panel. So please join me in welcoming Susanna Cass. Thank you, Dad. Well, good morning. I think my um, story is a little bit uh, different than Blake, which is a, who is a wonderful, wonderful speaker, you guys think? Yeah, I think we learned a lot from him. I was going through my checklist about which are the ones that I didn't do yet, you know, that he talked about. Uh, I guess my, um, my background a little bit more is I, it seems to be I can't just keep a job, huh? I just, <laughs> and like Blake, you know, who has this astounding career at Microsoft, I actually got a chance to uh, work with a couple of his group when I actually worked for Paul Allen, who was a co-founder. Um, for some of you have actually, my, um, know me uh, from some of my previous work at Pepperdine is uh, I, I really subscribe to the poem Robert Frost, um, The Road Not Taken. I fundamentally believe that uh, you have to do things with conviction and passion, even though you actually is an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. I think you take that attitude, you take that approach, it just makes your job going to work a lot easier because it's actually not a job anymore. You just like what you do and you're part of driven your own vision and you got a chance to work with some very smart people, hopefully friendly people who also you friend on Facebook. Um, I have actually definitely learned that in my um, career and which is why I'm so privileged today to actually have uh, my friends, my business partner actually on the panel uh, because I, I sincerely actually uh, learn a lot from the first panel speaker, Bill Vogel. Uh, he took a chance on me uh, when he founded Trilliant and, uh, and also become the CEO. He said, hey, here's some of the things that actually I don't like to do. Why don't you go do it? Uh, which is the mother of spreadsheet, I guess, huh, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> so um, he liked what I have done actually at eBay when I was the COO uh, for the international operation. And he did take a risk on me. I didn't come to him uh, as a traditional COO and really know a lot about energy. But I was very, very compassionate, still am, uh, in terms of bringing community together. Uh, done that at eBay time and time again for the all the countries that actually we launched eBay internationally and uh, still maintain a lot of contact. Actually, a few of them actually work for Blake now, so it's kind of fun. Uh, I am based in the Bay Area. And uh, so what we like to do actually when we construct the panel is I actually also get a chance to meet up with Natalie. I love her. I actually, we just met 10 seconds ago, right? Um, <laughs> Personally. But that's right. That's in person, in yeah, person, in person, in person. And I told her the story that actually when I worked for a couple of the venture fund, uh, be it Paul Allen, now Goldman Sachs and TVG Grove, and also at Sun for Java Fund, I actually helped lead that. Uh, we funded many companies, many entrepreneurs that I personally actually never met in person. And I said, well, before we deposit money, just make sure you have a mailbox, would you please? <laughs> so it's just a passion that, uh, and I'm now facilitating with entrepreneur, it just bring people together. Um, I love to catch up actually with Natalie a little bit later. Uh, some of the work she's done are uh, extremely different. Uh, she had the big idea and uh, love to hear more about from her in terms of the choices she had made uh, after actually having a phenomenal successful corporate career, a little bit kind of like mine that, you know, you work for a corporate company and what makes you decided that actually you're going to take that right moment and the right step to start your own. So I think that's a phenomenal story there and I, I think you will learn a lot from uh, this lady. Um, Prafu is sitting next to me. Um, need no introduction. Um, he is just, in my opinion, a solid individual 
um, have phenomenal introspective about the industry, um, very quick uh, in terms of the dynamism that I think he is just born ready in many of the different situations because it is very challenging at today's market um, in terms of the dreadful economy, don't know what the administrative policy is gonna take place, and you kind of have to navigate your journey and make many of the different decisions and bring it all together um, to hopefully make the right decisions uh, to, towards your vision and more responsibly actually for the company. He's a very, very committed uh, company man. I think he's probably one of the person that Blake described a little bit earlier by saying that, hey, this is not just about my spreadsheet, the mother of spreadsheet. I'm gonna keep talking about that now, learning from Blake. Um, it's really more about he taking care of his people, uh, his employee are phenomenally committed. I don't know how he does it in terms of all the different subsidiaries and countries that he actually managed and the wide uh, wingspan that he actually have and a bandwidth that he has in people. But somehow I think he's phenomenally successful in communication and delivery of uh, what he actually wanted the people to do and mobilize them to actually uh, to follow and to lead you know, some of the work that he's doing. So I, um, I'm very, very privileged to actually have these panelists have phenomenal amount of personal experiences and challenges and choices that they have. So I asked them today to put together a few slides. This is actually how we structure it. To talk about, uh, maybe one question I have for you guys to think about how you incorporate it. What was your first job? My first job. Yeah, and, oh. then, and then how did it actually bring you to your current role right now. Yeah. I think that would actually be maybe an interesting uh, experience that uh, our participant may learn today. And uh, so we'll start with Bill, and we'll go to Natalie and Prafu. Now, I'm not gonna do the traditional thing, because entrepreneurs always kind of have this code word that we can actually do things differently. <laughs> so um, it's very boring, we just kind of read the bio, you know? I mean, please, you guys, it's in front of you, okay? So if you have any question, I encourage you not to ask me because I usually don't have the answers, I usually have the one have the questions, please reach out uh, to each of the entrepreneur. Uh, we had a little breakfast in the morning, uh, and we all actually agree that, uh, more importantly, it's not so much what we're gonna deliver you in the next uh, 20, 30 minutes, whatever time that uh, Pepperdine allowed us, but Doug Howe, who I actually sincerely agree with what uh, Dean said earlier, he really put a lot of work to putting all this together, including the slide that you're gonna be seeing. He has all our contact information, so please leverage it. Uh, but it's your course. Whatever you wanna put in for the next session, however one you wanna drive the next session, is totally up to you. We're just here for you. Okay, so make it worth your while. We're not broadcasting. We genuinely want to interact with you, and we are all here today, we agree, to basically share with you um, our experiences. And remember that. We only have experiences because we make significant amount of mistakes. So we had one of those that actually have the most failures <laughs> and the most mistakes, but we learned from it, and we're still here. Okay, so enjoy, and uh, make it worth your while. Um, maybe part of it, the, the format would be, how about we save um, the questions uh, towards the end? At least then you get a chance to listen in and, and get some kind of a framework from each of the entrepreneurs. Would that be all right? So enjoy, and uh, yeah, we're ready. So you want me to do the slide, or how you want to do it? Sure, want to start off with Bill? Yes, that would be great. Bill, what was your first job? My first job? <laughs> <laughs> do I do I sit down and you you move no, the no, slides? No, I'm navigating. I'm uh, house girl. Oh, good. Okay. My first job was in the computer business back uh, back when there were uh, mini computers, if you can believe it, all the way back then for a company called Data General. Uh, I was uh, came out of college uh, with a computer science and economics background and got trained to be a salesman. Um, and much like uh, uh, some of the comments Blake made, I got quickly uh, funneled into being an entrepreneur with a company that needed to change from the old way of computing to open systems and Unix and, and uh, disk drive servers. So I got put in charge of a, basically a, a renegade group inside the company to actually change the company's direction and the selling process and all the product lines. Um, it was one of these companies where a lot of responsibilities given to somebody of very young age mostly because they have no political uh, conflicts and they're somewhat uh, expendable. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I learned a lot through that experience. Um, that was uh, uh, my, my first job. Uh, I, uh, the, the, the hardware business was very hard, if we all recall back then. Uh, and I decided to get into the software uh, area. This would be in 89. Uh, I worked for a company which at the time was uh, the largest public company run by a woman. Uh, it was a very freeing experience coming from a computer business that was mostly run by a, lot, a bunch of ex-IBM men. Um, uh, and I, uh, I learned a lot about people and people management and, uh, and the software industry. Um, and that company got acquired by uh, Computer Associates. The, uh, my first uh, entry into uh, what is now called clean tech was over 15 years ago with a company called Cellnet Data Systems. Uh, Cellnet was um, essentially one of the first networks for automated meter reading for the utility industry. And I had a, a background in major capital transactions, having run basically what was called major opportunities for a few companies. And they were looking for big guns, basically elephant hunters. And uh, I got involved with the company. Uh, it was, uh, they had 5,000 devices installed and $80 million in venture capital and $500,000 in revenue when I joined them. Um, and when I left, they had 600 people, uh, 10 million homes uh, were covered in North America, and uh, uh, they, uh, they had gone IPO and, and the whole like. So uh, I was in charge of sales and business development there. Uh, I also ended up, oddly speaking, uh, with the finance organization. Uh, that's kind of a colorful story about how things don't work. When the guy in charge of marketing ends up with finance, you know you're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but I, I took a little bit of a break, did some consulting for some early stage companies. I operated as a part-time CEO for a couple of uh, startups. And one of those startups had a venture firm that had an investment in a company up in Quebec uh, by the name of Nertech. As my daughter at the time said, you mean nerd tech? <laughs> and, uh, they had 15 million invested in the company. It was telephone lines into meters. I had already been drafting a vision of a new kind of business, which I had coined Smart Grid. This is many, many years ago. Um, I tried to convince those investors to reinvest because this telephone business was uh, a little bit beyond its uh, entry point. Uh, they gave me the CEO job in June, and I, I will quote the, the opening statement of the board of directors that day. Uh, congratulations, you're CEO, you have $300,000 in the bank, you have a $300,000 burn rate, you need to fire 12 people and we're not gonna give you another dime. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that was the beginning of Trillion. A year later, I bought the company on a loan from those investors. Uh, I reformulated a business which, which was uh, what I call the base hits business and a home runs business. Everybody invests in home runs, but they, uh, they keep investing with uh, companies that have base hits that keep the home runs alive. And so I had basically a business of putting cell phone technology into commercial advanced metering while I built uh, the most, what I at the time was the most advanced open systems network for the smart grid. Uh, using uh, what was uh, sensor and control technology from uh, Zigbee, which uh, some of the gentlemen here have talked about. Anyway, the, uh, that network was uh, very scalable. The Zigbee networks were designed for in-building technology. I did what was called Zigbee on steroids and made it go, you know, three or four kilometers instead of three or four hundred feet. Uh, ha put in all sorts of energy efficiency functionality, like its ability to control your thermostats, adjust to rates, uh, control your pool pump, adjust your water heater, uh, and um, so that small business kind of launched from nowhere uh, at one point. We started with one million in 2004, and a, a few years later when we had three million dollars, we won a 200 million dollar contract. 
and everybody was saying, well, gee, nobody could build this technology, and it's one of these, we didn't formally do a, a, you know, a stealth mode. It's just that in the energy business, if you can knock on a lot of doors and they don't even behave, pay attention to you until you actually have a contract. So uh, we ended up growing through $100 million in revenue in 08. Uh, GE's uh, power generation CEO now runs that. I did a private equity round and handed that over to him uh, last, uh, well, I left last March. And I'm now starting a company, or, or picked up another company, similar kind of early stage. Uh, I would like to go back to the, to the Nurtech story a bit, because Blake's comments were very, uh, very hit, hit at home with me. Uh, there were 30 people in that little business up in Quebec. Um, I had to hand everybody a, a, their last paycheck on, before December, before Christmas, before starting and restarting the company, pay out their vacation and promise that I'd do my best to reform the company within 45 days. And that effort uh, led, because I came through, led to a very tight integrity uh, trust relationship with a core group of employees. And I, I think I'd point out that honesty, integrity, and clarity are at the heart of, of what an entrepreneur needs to do because when you are banking on something that's a big play and you, 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 people need to believe in you and that you're, you have their, their needs at heart. So, um, if we move on to the next slide, Apparent is, uh, like Nurtech, uh, is formed from a company called Excellent Energy Technology. Uh, it has patented technology that makes efficiency in and around solar panels. So instead of just making the output of solar panels happen, it creates a grid in and around the solar panels to make the whole building more efficient. It makes it generate about 30 to 50 percent more power in a distributed generation environment. And the most important thing that probably not many know is that most of your renewables are actually increasing the demand for fossil fuel generation right now. They are erratic, uh, imbalanced uh, generation technologies that require more grid power there's a different type of power besides your own power that kind of confuses people. But it's coming all the way from the central station so that, 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 that a grid exists so that your solar power can actually come onto the grid. And the solar panels fight with the grid, which is why we don't get as much credit in renewables. They actually, it's like a, a slow tributary fighting with a rushing river. It, it's the best way to describe it. So this technology creates what's true distributed generation. Every time you generate power, it's relieving all of the fossil fuel requirement upstream, which is really important. And you can actually get paid for that other type of power, which is also nice. So there's extra credits. So that's, uh, that's the business in a nutshell. Um, can I go to the next slide? Uh, what is it? Because you know you talk about all these things, like uh, Blake said, you know, and they pe people get their eyes glass over, and you say, well, you know, what is it? Essentially, it's just a smart grid device that interfaces with a panel and creates what's called a microgrid. Uh, each panel becomes a an appliance. You plug it in, but it's a full generator in its own right. It and it's adaptable and it's internet controlled and. Therefore, it can be tailored to what happens at your house, which is really important. Next slide. The big issue in energy efficiency, which you'll hear people talk to, is we, we've, we have gone through so many genesis of making power generation more efficient, lights more efficient, uh, your air conditioner more efficient. Each thing in isolation is efficient. You put them together, and they're inefficient. Uh, I was up at US UCSB yesterday, and this guy was showing me this really great model where they're censoring and monitoring all of a building, and they had found this really big loss, and what essentially was the air conditioner next to the data center cooling center. So you have the one cooling like crazy, and the other one reacting and creating this 
this, uh, and so it's, an, it's one of these things that unless you understand how they interrelate, they don't, you don't understand how you're wasting power. And the same thing goes with the electricity. The devices you plug in actually are worse uh, at some times than better. Your Energy Star uh, air conditioners actually when we all need power at the same time are less efficient than the old air conditioner that you had because it's like a four-cylinder a four automobile uh, trying to get on to the Autobahn. Uh, so it's, a, it's essentially, there are some j issues around energy efficiency which are holistic, and so I focus on those. And that's what this does. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Yep. Natalie, why don't you share with us a little bit about your background and uh, what was your first job? <laughs> oh my God, it was so long ago. Um, I, I also started in computers, but in 1968, so we didn't have many computers then. Our computers were as big as this building, the IBM 360. Uh, I worked at Bell Laboratories at the time. I was one of only three women in the whole laboratory, and the, nobody was, uh, nobody could get up. The, the glass ceiling was on the floor. <laughs> so um, I, being a little bit uppity, said I'm not going to, do this for the rest of my life, and I decided to go to law school. So, because I thought I would have, you know, more power, I came out to Los Angeles. Um, when I started at O'Melveny and Myers in 1973, we were supposed to. The idea was that you would have a 40-year law career there. That was going to be where you started, and when you stopped your career, and anybody who didn't follow that path was thought to be pretty flaky. I guess I was pretty flaky because I could not see myself sitting in the same 39th floor office overlooking what was then the smog line for the rest of my life. So, um, and also in 1973 when I started practicing law, there was still quite a lot of prejudice against women in the legal community. I was one of the first women lawyers in the corporate law firms in this town, so I decided I better have something that differentiated me from, from that, that if clients needed this particular business, they'd have to come to me, whether I was a woman or not. And so I decided to move to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, because that was the time of the Brazilian miracle. Brazil was growing, and nobody speaks Portuguese here. And so I decided to do that. So I went to Brazil. I went there at the end of 78. Everybody told me, oh my god, nobody goes to Brazil. Like, if I had gone to France, that would have been okay. But nobody went to Brazil, and people said, oh, you must have a boyfriend there. And I didn't know anybody there, right? I mean, nobody could think you could go to Brazil unless you had a boyfriend there. But I went because I thought it was a really incredible business opportunity. And I'm very happy to say 30 years later, Brazil is really happening. You know, it's taken a while. It's very exciting to see that. And I mentioned the Brazil part because that became the basis of what I'm doing as an entrepreneur. Um, so eventually I became a partner in a very fancy, prestigious corporate law firm. I did that. Um, I had a daughter, and so I decided to go out on my own as a lawyer. Law firms, and at the time I became a partner, this still had very few women partners, and it really wasn't very hospitable. So I just decided to start my own firm. I wanted to be able to be with my daughter when I wanted to be there, et cetera. So I did that for a long time. but. Uh, and I, I, I started off a very great law firm. My corporate one, Fortune 100 clients came with me from the other firm, so it was very good. But uh, my relationship as Brazil started to really emerge, the practice became more and more related to Brazil. Um, I'm an intellectual property lawyer, an entertainment lawyer, and uh, that's kind of important in this story too. So. Why did I do what I did? Well, after 30 years of practicing law, frankly, I was just really bored. You know, you just, you just, I don't know. I don't know how many times you can do the same kind of transaction. I, mean, I was just, and I thought, today people have multiple careers, people are living longer, and if I have to do this for the next 25 years, I'm just gonna jump off of a building. So I decided, to, I had graduated from UCLA Law School in 73, and I went back and I got my MBA. Uh, with the class of uh, 2003, and uh, it was great. I mean, you just can't imagine the difference between going to law school and starting in 1970 and going and getting an MBA in 2003. I mean, it was it was fabulous, and uh, I want I was 
I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly. And then I thought I had been doing more and more with Brazil, and I wanted to do something between California and Brazil. Brazil was really coming on, and I'm passionate about renewable energy. And Brazil was doing really great with sugarcane ethanol. They, for 30 years, they've been doing it. They had the same oil crisis we had in the 70s. And when our oil prices went back down, we went back to our old habits. We had a lot of renewable energy, uh, you know, R&D at that time, and then that stopped. But Brazil had to continue. They had no oil whatsoever, so they had to come up with other solutions. And they started building their sugarcane ethanol uh, industry, which is now preeminent uh, in the world. And everybody thinks they're great. But, but what happens, unlike with corn ethanol, which does not have biomass associated with it. Sugarcane ethanol is a bit, I, I wish I'd, I have a picture, I think, of some of my sugarcane that I grew here. Um, if you, yeah. So this is sugarcane I grew here in California, and uh, the sugarcane's in a stalk in the middle, looks like bamboo, and then you have all this green biomass around it. So when you are taking your sugarcane to the, uh, the the stock, the bamboo, with the sugarcane juice in it to be fermented, distilled, and made into ethanol, you're also taking your power source because you can burn all that green stuff in a boiler and turn it, it generates steam that turns, turns a steam turbine that generates electricity. Uh, so the good news, uh, so, so I decided to do that. I came back, I, came, I spent five months in the sugarcane fields in Brazil in 2005 learning about this. I speak Portuguese. And uh, so I came back and I said, California is the greatest agricultural state in this country, and let's see if we can do this here. California is as dependent on the Midwest for ethanol, which is required to be blended in our gasoline, at least 6.9%. Uh, we now have 10% in California. It's re so we are as dependent on the Midwest and Iowa for the ethanol in our gasoline as the U.S. is dependent on foreign nations. And we have, you know, about a billion, one point billion gallons a year of demand, and none of it is being made here, very little, 60 million gallons. So I saw that as a real business opportunity that uh, nobody was doing anything about. Uh, for reasons having to do with the economic crisis that we're in and the volatility of the oil uh, you know, I, I don't know how many of you remember that oil went from, I think, $80 a barrel to $147 a barrel and then tanked and went back to $40 a barrel and stayed in the $40, $45 range for a while. So it became really impossible to get a long-term offtake agreement for the sugarcane ethanol. So I kind of jettisoned that part because what easy, is easy to do is to get a long-term offtake agreement for electricity. Even in a recession, depression, or whatever it is that we have, people are turning on the lights and using electricity, plugging in things. So the utilities who serve the retail electricity need to enter into long-term agreements with generators of electricity uh, to sell that electricity, and the, the utilities are very creditworthy. So what I did is I took my original plan to, uh, to, do, to produce two renewable energy products, sugarcane ethanol and bioelectricity from the cane's biomass. I kind of jettisoned the sugarcane ethanol part for right now till conditions get better. Maybe I'll never do it because it turns out I love the power plant, power generation business. And so now we are strictly a power generation company. I'm developing um, a utility scale power plant here in California. Um, it turns out that I'm the only, apparently the only uh, woman-owned business utility-scale power plant developer in the country. So that's kind of fun. Um, so if we, yeah, let, let's go back to that slide. Just for Which slide do you want? That, go the one just previous. One before? Yeah, just to say what we are. Okay. We're, we're 49.5 megawatts, and I want to explain to you why ha we have such a strange number of megawatts, why it's not 50. If anybody looks, because I, I, this is interesting from a business model point of view, I think. Um, in California, the way the law uh, works, any power plant that's under 50 megawatts is permitted at the local level. Anything 50 megawatts and above has to go to the California Energy Commission. Now, it may be changing a little bit now, but... The California Energy Commission was like, 
I don't know, black hole of whatever, uh, you know, you'd go in as an elephant and you'd come out as a camel two years or three years later and several million dollars later. Um, and then you might not get it anyway. And you, so the county that I'm in, so, well, okay, so we're, here's where we are. We're in late stage development. I have that great team that Blake was talking about. I'm not an engineer. I've never run a power plant. So I had to get the best people, and they are all passionate. They are all, pa they're, they're all men, but they all see me as their leader. I have no problem with that. It's great. We're really a tight team. We've been working together for four years, and I have great agronomists and great engineers, and we're just like crazed ab about this. And we know that if we do this here in California with the California, the, the most stringent emission requirements in all the world, will be setting the template for the whole world going forward. Because in Brazil, for example, where they generate electricity and they've been doing it from biomass for a long time, they don't have the same emissions requirements that we have here in California. So we know that once we do this, we can, we can t show China how to do it. We can do it all through the United States and everything. So that's part of our passion, that we can really make a difference more than just in California. And we're, we're pretty far along. We're, we're mid to late, getting to very late stage development, which uh, people are frankly amazed by because it's very hard to get, we have a, uh, we're just about in the, the middle of uh, documenting our PPA, power purchase agreement, and apparently nobody can get them um, at this time. So, and we have a great partner, credit worthy uh, off taker called SCAPA, the Southern California Public Power Authority. So I guess we can go to the next one. Another reason that we did this, we are in California's Imperial Valley, and I don't know if anybody knows the Imperial Valley, but it's not what anybody thinks California is. It's one of the greatest agricultural areas in the country, but it's a desert. Uh, it's the biggest county with the, um, uh, the smallest population, and it, ha it has the highest rate of unemployment in the entire United States, which is over 30%. So there, yeah, it really does. It's not Indiana, it's not Iowa. It's right here in California. And so there, we, remember that I said we'll be per permitted locally. So we are per being permitted in a county that really wants us. It has a sparse population, so you're not like you're on the coast where you, you, you there, there's no industry there. So you're not pollute, you're not adding to a really polluted area with air emissions. So we are really, the, we have a lot of uh, political support and a lot of passion there. So, and we won't have the same environmental problems that other people have. And people, I know the conventional wisdom is, because I've had to talk to investors, you know, forever, that uh, you can't get anything, a power plant or anything permitted in California. And it's just, again, there's this conventional, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit, because we have to talk about what, uh, we were asked to talk about what some of our challenges are. My greatest challenge is overcoming the conventional wisdom. Uh, I think that's one of the greatest, the greater challenges. And there's another one too that I will discuss with you. But anyway, that's the Imperial Valley. Um, so, let me just move to this. So, we were, so where's our position in the green space? Well, it has to do with what Bill was talking about too. Natalie, because can we keep it to another two more minutes? Yeah, oh, okay, thank you. So um, we also realize that solar and wind are intermittent, and so our solution is to provide baseload, steady state electricity. That's what we're doing, and that's what you can do with biomass. You can do it all through the country. Um, I'm just gonna mention that Vinod Koshla said that with just solar and wind, all these electric cars that are coming will be plugging into a lump of coal because <laughs> You have to have baseload biomass electricity, so just want people to think about that. You can read about the other things about this, you know, what, what we're doing, we're closed loop, it's the first closed loop biomass plant where we're gonna grow crops just to burn in the boiler. Um, and this is the right state for it. We have a very aggressive, it's called the Renewables Portfolio Standard, 20% uh, by 2020. All, uh, the, all of the util investor-owned utilities now have to serve 20% of their electricity from renewable sources by 2020, and it's now going to move up to 33% by, uh, 20 by 2010, 20, 33% by 2020. So California is the place to do it. Um, I guess that's really, real. oh, just one thing that I wanted to say. So the good, the really great news about my project is 
the technology works. This, this is not like cellulosic ethanol and something like that. The technology works. This is standard heartland boiler technology, steam turbines, the technology works. The bad news about my project is the technology works because there is no venture capital for anything like this. When I started this, I uh, just assumed I'm in California, venture capital, renewable energy. I would have never started it, I don't think, because I'm into it for $2 million right now because there is no venture capital. And, um, and project development is very expensive. It's not like Yahoo where you can scale up or intellectual property driven uh, uh, startups. It's very tough. Blake alluded to that. It's very expensive to permit and do the engineering and everything you have to do for a power plant. So from a, uh, a startup perspective, there's that. But we're getting through it. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you for sharing your story. It's very, very today and real. Prafu, uh, how about yeah. you tell us a little bit more about I, your company and I, your vision? I have, I have a couple of different thoughts. So, can I stand up? Is that all right? You can dance if you want. Shall we? <laughs> have a okay. Seat. I, I'm Sounds good. To, uh, okay. Make this a little more informal and get, see, sure. get some interactivity. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you. Can you hear me without the mic? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many of you are either entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs? Wow. You guys supposed to raise it. That's great. That's great. That's right. I, I wanted to kind of bring this back uh, to my experience. You know, I come from an industry uh, that is mature. We've been building since ancient civilization. So, and I'm a master builder. So. It is very important uh, for you to know, my first job, by the way, Susanna, was as an architect for a company called Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, uh, mm -hmm. which is an institution in the United States and internationally. Um, the world's tallest building that is in Dubai right now uh, was designed by them. And um, we all come from different experiences in terms of uh, our origins and uh, how we go on in life. And, uh, it was a great experience, uh, as you probably can tell. I'm from Ireland. Um, <laughs> <laughs> people do make that mistake. Uh, Kularni, Kulkarni, it's all the same. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, <laughs> That's cute. But, but, but we all come through different experiences, different backgrounds. I had my chance to come here um, on a Rockefeller Foundation fellowship to my godfathers and went to school in Chicago and went to work for Skidmore and then Merrill. And Skidmore at that time, uh, the world was just coming out of an energy crisis. Um, the 73 oil embargo. And there was a whole bunch of work being done in the Middle East because they ended up with so much cash. So my first exposure to energy was back then. The thing that I want to talk to you about is mature entrepreneurship. Because unlike new technologies, unlike high technology, uh, building is a mature profession. So I gathered experience and developed skill sets, uh, skill sets in terms of on-the-job training, so to speak, and then came to Pepperdine and tried to put in perspective so what do, what do we need in entrepreneurship? We need, in my opinion, we need, we need three things. That great idea that Bill talked about. That's something unique that you can provide to the marketplace and you're passionate about it. And it needs to be founded on core principles. And the core principles, the, the thing that Pepperdine put together for me was not that I want to make a ton of money. I want to believe in something that I want to do for the people. And if your professional training is in that area, then you need to get passionate about it. Do a great job managing that process 
and the byproduct is going to be your reward, which is professional and financial. So that's what I believe in, and that's what I do. We started this company back in 91, and you can, these are just props, you can read about it. But to me, the key is you need, the first thing that we talked about was the passion and this unique thing. The second part is you got to have the ability to produce that product. I mean, it's one thing to sell it, talk about these great ideas, but you need to have a team that can actually produce that, where your clients, you can sell a job once, just through salesmanship. But if you cannot produce that, you won't get the next one. And so those two things are very important. And then you have to manage the finance and accounting piece. You have to get paid. It has to be well managed to have a financial bottom line. So you may be strong in one area. It's unlikely that you'll be strong in all three areas. So you need to have good, solid partners. It's that strength and weakness thing that we'll talk about. Is you need to know what your strengths are and cover your weaknesses. And that will take you there. Uh, touching base on the green space, this is just basic information. We are a sizable company. By the way, we, I had a BHAG. In fact, this company is out of the Ember 9 91 program. And I wanted to have a big, hairy, audacious goal of $1 billion as a marker in 10 years. And here I am, 19 years later, and I'm only a fifth of the way. So that's how life goes sometimes, but you gotta have that, it's a marker. What we're trying to do now is, the building industry has evolved over the years, as you can tell, when we used to, some people say we're still putting buildings together just like the way we did the pyramids, block by block, brick by brick but it is changing in a big way in terms of new technologies. And the new technologies in terms of producing drawings and putting buildings together become a part of the process and you continually keep evolving. In a similar manner, the green technologies need to become a culture of your company. I remember in the late 70s, CAD was a we'll CAD was a new thing. I'm going to three minutes. Uh, CAD was a new thing, computer assisted uh, design and drafting. Now, it's part of the system. So we need to look at green technology in the same manner, so that it's part of the texture or the fabric of the company. A couple of examples. Um, this is a about a billion dollar project in India. And um, uh, there's something called LEED, uh, which is a certification process for green buildings. So this is going to be a gold LEED standard. And just to put this in uh, context, these are the different things that we do, <coughs> energy conservation, water conservation, sustainable materials, indoor air quality, the air that we breathe, and the green construction practices. And then we apply these to building products. Uh, Pierce College, it's an unusual project. We're doing a maintenance and operation building, uh, and this is what we call a zero, net zero building. That means whatever we are doing here through solar panels, we're generating sufficient energy that the building will take care of itself. And that's where we want to go. That's the overall perspective. And then another example is the Victor Valley Solar Farm. This is a one megawatt facility with uh, concentrated photovoltaic cells. And um, its payback is uh, five years, and it's going to save about $20 million uh, over a 25-year period. And it supplies a third of the energy for the Victor Valley College. So there are just a couple of examples. I know this is about entrepreneurship, but my point, again, was how do we 
weave green into the business, in a mature business, and there are different ways entrepreneurs can succeed. But if you take the mature entrepreneurship approach, chances are you're going to succeed better than the conventional entrepreneur who fails and succeeds. Thank you, Prabhu. Great. So now this is the uh, official Q&A sessions. Um, who would like to have a question for clarification? Please, sir. Yes. Um, so interesting talking about the load balance and challenges associated with uh, both solar and wind and any intermittency area of the dependence on fossil fuels. Um, many different ways to solve for that. That's kind of like the, the dilemma of the past. Is it, uh, aren't there enough advances coming down the road in storage that will illuminate that? Um, ironically, uh, and this is part of the problem of what I call pet industry uh, government uh, stimulation, uh, and part of the issues that Natalie, all the venture world is looking for game-changing technology that are long-run hits. Uh, batteries have gotten a lot of hype, uh, and, and storage as a, a generation source is extremely expensive. Uh, and the pet industry of wind does not want to be forced to, to do storage, even though basically you really shouldn't do wind without storage. But there, so they, it's one of these things where uh, getting those things to work together Likely storage will get bought down like solar and wind through government help and, and getting the cost per, per unit down, but it's, it's a, a, a long distance away from where it needs to be. Can I, can I say something about that too? Yeah. Please. Um, first of all, I agree completely with everything that Bill said, and we don't know when and, and how long it's going to be between. You know, I, I just read recently that the cellulosic ethanol people are saying if they don't get a great deal of help from the government, they're not going to get it. Um, we need electricity now, and we need to reduce greenhouse gases now. I have read that if we do not solve the greenhouse gas issue problem and start going the other way in this next 10 years, then it doesn't matter when solar when storage is ready 20 years from now because it's going to be irreversible. And so we have technologies that work now, 24-7. Yeah. So we have to pay some attention to those things. So I was just yeah. going to say. And, and, and I think just to follow on, we, we should get away from the whole history is you build a gas plant or you build solar or you build wind. There should be some economics that incent everything to do the right thing and renewable portfolio standards is a good step in that direction. Yeah. It's, a, you know, it's a very good point. Uh, one of the things that you probably know is 40% of all the energy needs are for buildings. So it's that incremental piece that we need to take care of, is that if we actually have a net zero solution for buildings, guess what is happening? Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the thing I was talking about in terms of, a, it's not load balancing, think about it as in interactive energy efficiency. What you don't know is that all of your assets are actually competing with each other. And you, what you, we're losing 15, 20% just because all of those assets are kind of incented to be measured independently. And I would have to admit that um, being an entrepreneur, one of the key aspects that I learned at Pepperdine and Professor Larry Cox, and I have been continuing talking about it is, uh, don't stay on the surface and be a really critical thinker. So if you think about storage, uh, I hope you all know that actually electric vehicle is not a car. The way how Susanna look at that is, is genuinely storage that can move around. You can actually power up the car, run around, do whatever you do, and you bring it back to your home or your work and whatnot, and that actually you know, depends on your household in terms of the kilowatt and the consumption and whatnot. One car can actually power your car power your house. Uh, for my household anyway, uh, Bill will be a little bit different because he has a whole rack, you know, in his garage <laughs> and a roof. But for mine, at household, you know, my husband and I, two dogs, two girls, although the, the two children have a lot more pluck low because they're in the teenager years, um, probably can do four and a half days. Yeah. So I just do two charge, depends how I run around, 
I don't pay anything. That's a zero energy that um, preferred I talked about, right? And uh, so, and I got a car out of it. Um, now I'm not like AMG and E series, and uh, but I feel pretty good. And if you take a look at Fisk, you know, Fisker and Tesla, that you know, that fill your personality too. So, be an entrepreneur. I think the key thing is you actually look beyond that. And at eBay, I oftentimes talk to my students and my group and people hire. We have nothing to do with auction. A lot of people just think we're auction, which is why we dish the name E auction. We say, hey, that's too limiting. We are all about commerce and bringing buy and sell it together. And uh, some of our users tell us on things that we would never blow their mind away. I, we cannot possibly claim the credit that Beanie Babies, believe it or not, actually becoming the, uh, a persistence uh, in terms of the property. So I, I would say, you know, look beyond that, which is why we have the panelists here talked about it, is they all kind of interrelated. Excellent question. Thank you. May I have another one? Please, lady. As end users, whether you're a business or a consumer, how can we help drive the change and let the people know, Democrat, Republican, Blue Slate, Red State, that we want these changes because some of the drive, I imagine, needs to come from also the consumer? Natalie, that one is for you. Um, that is definitely right. There's a problem going on now with these renewable portfolio standards, which we need to be moving to. California, we're far ahead, but in other states, um, they're dropping uh, contracts with renewable sources of electricity because it costs more to generate. I mean, just let me say, base load, the reason that there has, everything solar wind, solar wind, and not base load is because we have a very easy, cheap way to have base load electricity. It's coal fired or it's natural gas. And the coal comes and gets into the hopper and you know everybody knows how to do that. Natural gas, you turn on the spigot. So the, uh, the uh, utilities that have a big installed base of, co uh, of coal-fired plants don't want to change. It's very cheap and they know how to do it. Agriculture, they don't know how to grow crops and do all that. So we have uh, something to go over. But because those things are so cheap, renewable electricity costs more and all of the politicians today are afraid of, even though people say they want renewable energy, there was one contract last week that was going to raise rates 0.2%. And it raised a big. Yeah, it, 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 anytime somebody tries to, 0.2%, and another one, 0.1%. And people say they want it, and they uh, threw out these contracts because they say we can't, we can't raise. So it's like what's going on in this country anyway. I mean, we all want Social Security, we all want this, but nobody wants to pay for it. So if citizens would make it known that they're willing to do it. Yeah. I, I've got a, it's a little bit of a sarcastic idea, but if we required all corporate America to spend four times as much on green technology as they do on green advertising, <laughs> That's great. we would be much better. The utilities, the energy companies spend huge amounts on, on, on image, mm -hmm. right. and it's really, it, it, you know, the, 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 guy, the, biggest, the biggest coal in, uh, producer in the in North America is one of the biggest advocates for green and really as a as a actual step in green has not made a lot of steps. Or what so, about BP? Yeah. Remember they're beyond yeah. beyond power. The, the beyond. other thing is, uh, and this is a bit crossing politics. Democrat Republican doesn't care. Uh, we we make a, a portfolio standard in California, but. We're, in we're actually incenting industries that are outside of California because our cost of building in California is, is high. And it's based on our complex and progressive tax, tax structure. It's, you, know, you, can, you can get a loan for the government to build uh, car, cars at a plant and create 2,000 jobs, but all the parts for those plants, which is 50,000 more jobs, are being built somewhere else because the cost of those parts is much cheaper elsewhere, and here you're, you're taxed on each piece of, uh, of the value chain. So I, I thank you for that question. Uh, actually, if it is not even clear, let me make it really, really um, clear to the audience. Um, Natalie did a fantastic job in actually walking us through about how we talk about the legal background, when she actually think about where she placed her company, how she legally formed her company, and leveraging the agenda she actually has to her advantage. It is all about differential advantages for entrepreneur. You need that edge, and you need your edge to be phenomenally pronounced. 
So this is not so much just about when I do my business plan, I'm just going to take a look at my target market, what is my TAM, what is my reachable market. You, you have to understand about a very good condition. You must be the best person in your businesses when you have your idea about how you look out in terms of day ahead of what your weather condition be. Unless you actually really enjoy um, you know, her pain and whatnot, you want to find the least persistent path to kind of get you where you wanted to go. That's absolutely shameless, in my opinion. You can beg, you can go there, and you ask people to help you. That's including the people, you have the resources over that, and you go in and then basically leverage any resources. We're here for Pepperdine, not so much just give you an education. I hope you stay connected with your community, with the alum, and you will then give back. I mean, read the slogan down here, right? You receive and you give, which is what we want to do is actually build a community. Together, all of us will help you get there where you want it to be. And we absolutely love to be part of it because I know I can absolutely get some help out here from the audience. And, uh, and that's basically what it's all about. So entrepreneur is about leveraging, understanding where the condition, but stay very focused is where you want to be and be adaptable. You know, you know it's good, the weather's going to change tomorrow. You may decide to do something differently and stay true to the goal. You accept that you may just take a different vehicle. Um, how about one more question? If you have any. Yes, please, sir. Please. If you take three patient producers and one common footprint energy, which would be water, wind, and soap, and throw away biomass, ten years from now, how would you? see each one of those as far as donating to the power requirements of the country? Well, uh, I think to... to Let's rephrase to, the question. Yeah. yeah, to be fair to Natalie, uh, if we separate base load, I think biomass will have, and, and solar will have a more base load value than wind. But wind will still be the largest because of how early it started and its cost per watt. It's basically, you're paid the same rate and whether you produce wind at night, which is what a lot of the wind happens, or you produce it in the afternoon when it's much more valuable. And so right now, uh, we actually have a kind of a, an incentive for more wind farms, even though it's off cycle. Um, so. I agree with Bill, and but I think his answer has has a lot of evidence, depends on the geographic location across the world, 137 yeah. countries we have here, yeah. and what the government policy might be in terms of facilitate that. Uh, for example, I specifically know uh, Hawaiian Electric actually has shifted the gear, which is the whole islands of Hawaii, um, from solar to actually wind. Okay, so you gain more, a lot of incentive from the utility in that way. So you want to make sure you map that in when you actually look at the whole total value that you're going to produce. And so I, I, if you don't have any other question, I'd like Can to- Can I just say something about that? Yeah, of course, of okay. course, Natalie, sorry. I, I'm just going to chime in here. Um, first of all, we're going to be, uh, Solar and wind are highly dependent on government uh, production tax credits that are going to expire in 2013, 2012. And I don't know about you, but I'm not dependent on anything from this Congress here or not. I'm just depending on what we have now, number one. Number two, we are going to be, our project makes money without, and we don't have any agricultural subsidies. I hate subsidies, and I, I don't want to be dependent on subsidies because who give us subsidies takes them away. Same thing with these tax credits. So actually, we're driving the cost way down to below, way down below the solar and wind. The other thing I want to say is, in this country, um, we don't have solar everywhere. We don't have wind everywhere. We have biomass everywhere in this country. There are crops grown, there are for, you know, woody biomass, there's demolition waste, there's you know, wood waste, there's ag waste, ag prunings and things like that. So I actually think that once we get over the conventional wisdom, which is the only, only type of renewable energy we have is solar and wind, when we get these utilities over the fact that they can't use coal or natural gas anymore, you're gonna see a tremendous growth of biomass. And I'm, I'm seeing that now. My project has a lot of traction now. And uh, so it's, it's changing. Great. So my last question actually to the panel, and I'll start with Prafu, okay, and uh, to provide you the answer.
So going back to that, as we all look out in the future on the green era, which you really just can't avoid to read the news and be part of the community, and hopefully you all take part in that. Um, and as an entrepreneur, you actually take the choices and the challenge. Um, how would you sum up the, the one lesson that you'd like to impart today that symbolizes about your experience in five words or less? I, I keep going back to the net zero. Uh, the point being that 40% of the energy consumption in the world is in buildings. So if we can create buildings uh, in a very responsible way where there is no energy required for them, uh, I think we come out 40% ahead, 40% reduction in energy consumption. Thank you. Nally? Well, I agree with a lot of things that have been said here, a lot of things that Blake said, a lot of things that my co-panelists have said. I think if the one thing that I would say is, when I was in business school, I think I, I wish I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody say, think outside the box, think outside the box. I actually believe that people don't think outside the box. They keep shuffling the box around, you know, solar, wind, solar, whatever. And I would say, look for opportunities, you know, really get into the weeds, if, uh, an area that you're passionate about, and look, you know, don't pay attention to the conventional wisdom. Use your brains to see where the opportunities lie, because there are so many. And don't just get suckered in with conventional wisdom. Um, and I would say uh, green tech is wide open for a tremendous amount of opportunity. There's more than one solution. And actually, a hybrid um, thinking is likely to be a winner. You just need to pick the right one to go with. So. And for my answer, um, for you would be build your own power map. Yeah. What does that mean? We are here for your success. It's OK to be self-driven yeah. to get your goal. We are all here to enable you to get to where you are. Know where you're going to get the experience that you lack. You can complement and fill the gap by having an education, or you can hire some people or surround yourself with some smart people that get you where you want to go. Know where you got to get capital. You do need that for sustainability growth. Not just start a company for seed, but ensure that your company and your client needs are being taken care of. So you do need to have the access to the capital and get the power map. The third one is, at the end of the day, a lot of people talk about the whole social. Uh, yeah, it'd be great to know where the party is, although I think that's a very interesting story, that knowing your teenager is throwing a party when you're actually 100 miles away. Um, so be connected. I think that would be great. And, uh, and spend your time in terms of you know, all that interaction to people who are actually meaningful to you, who are the VIP in your life that you actually wanted to kind of get done, because you only have a limited amount of time. And you need to kind of have some way of measuring the effectiveness of those relationships. And I believe that is extremely important. And um, that's why we are here. And I thank again Pepperdine for hosting this event and all the wonderful sponsors that we actually have, the Capitol. <laughs> and I thank all the brain in terms of the experiences for the group. So please join me in thanking Pepperdine and also our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you.